Jesus to all of you. It's uh, really good to be here and stand among you uh, this, this night, this holy night. I asked the congregation this morning, what would it be if uh, you didn't have some things happening? Uh, it, it just wouldn't be Christmas unless yada, yada, yada. And it happened for me just a few moments ago. Come on, help me out. In excelsis Deo, Gloria. In excelsis Deo. Thank you. It just wouldn't be Christmas until that happens in a sanctuary someplace on this planet that we call Earth, in this world that God so loved that he sent his only begotten son. And so here I am standing in front of you. I'm a 75-year-old person who has had the glorious privilege of being able to pastor 14 different congregations since I moved to Michigan in 1995. And uh, it's been marvelous. It's been good stuff. And to stand here uh, after I've retired, I, I failed retirement uh, eight or nine times. Uh, not, not good at retirement. But, but to stand here on this holy night and be uh, with people who have come to express their faithfulness. And you wouldn't be here unless you uh, knew something about this God who created us. So, I am going to uh, help you this evening, I hope, by uh, being brief. But I want you to, to hear a couple of things. I'm going to read you uh, a dramatic reading by a man named Ted Loder. And uh, he has written a book called Tracks in the Straw. And it's a, it's a collection of vignettes of how the, the, the Christmas story could be told in a different way. And the first vignette, the one that I'm going to read, uh, is about uh, a priest uh, who was in the temple uh, when Herod was king. And I, I like to understand that uh, when we hear all these stories and all the ways that we, that we put things together and we understand about the Virgin Mary and Mary and Joseph and Anna and Zechariah and, and all, the, all the people that were about that time, there's, there's incongruency in, if you want to do the, uh, the historical record with Quirinius and Herod and Jesus and, and, and uh, Caesar Augustus it doesn't quite match with who was in, where they were at the, at the time. But the story is congruent. The story sticks together. And so I'm going to uh, read this uh, vignette, and then I'm going to tell you a short, true story uh, that uh, helps me understand about the mystery of faith. And some of you, I'm sure, have uh, uh, had this experience where you've had questions that just couldn't be answered, and that's okay. I'm, I'm here to, to confess to you uh, that even when you know the answers, I uh, started to prepare for this evening and to preach uh, uh, two different sermons on the same day is not uh, something that everybody invites, uh, but I did invite it, and so did the district superintendent, Reverend Jody Flessner, when she called me, and I said, sure, you know, I, I will do this. And, and I want to I I thank Wendy. Uh, you have made this uh, easy, so thank you. So here we are, uh, and I, I said to myself, what can I talk about? The, well, the mystery of faith. Of course, I can do that, sure. And so I went right. I, I have most of the Bible memorized. I, I do not. That was a lie. Uh, but but I, I went right to Romans 11, chapter 1, and I began to read this. No, no, that's not what I want to talk about. And then it dawned on me, dummy, you don't want Romans chapter 11, verse 1. You want... Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Does, does anybody know what that says? I bet some of you do. You probably said it a couple of times. The meaning of faith. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. The assurance of things hoped for. The conviction, the understanding, the uh, I really know this. 
the conviction of things not seen. And uh, that is a hard rub for some people to try to understand God and not be able to point to the hard, fast evidence uh, of, of who God is. Sometimes you have to draw lines. And sometimes you have to bend those lines or, or even ignore the boundaries. But most of the time, you have to walk the line. You have to walk a tight line. The trouble is knowing which to do when. The difference. When is the voice of conscience more critical than the voice of the court? You don't always know, said the priest. You don't always know. It's hard to keep your balance, and surely you know, too, it's easier to, co to compromise. It's always easier to compromise. And your conscience is a challenge to all the power that's in the earth. Your question is always more powerful than any answer that someone else can give you. So when Herod calls, when Herod calls, you go. It was early in the evening when he called. The time I'm speaking of now was early in the evening, just about this time of day. It had been a long day. I even questioned why I ever wanted to be a priest. The temple in Jerusalem, the temple in Jerusalem is always a busy place and, and we have responsibilities there, you know, a thousand responsibilities. Often they keep me awake at night. The wall of the temple needs repair. Oil is running low for all the lamps that need to be around the, around the temple to light it. Revenues. Revenues from sacrificial animals are way off, and there are services to be going through, and, and always there are political pressures to contend with, and Rome, on one hand, is not easy for us. The zealots, on the other hand, are twice as hard. Do you submit to power, or do you resist? Do you find where the compromise needs to take place? And if you resist, how much do you resist? How far do you go and how far do you stick your neck out? And, and always there's pressure. The pressure, when does one find time to think about such questions, to reflect, to study? You see, I am a temple generalist. I don't have a specific gift, but I have to know a little bit about all things. You might say, that I am a jack-of-all-trades priest. I tell you, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard to keep your balance. The days are always long, and the, this particular day has been one of the longest. We were meeting in the courtyard, and the chief priest and the scribes and everybody were talking about how Rome's tax rulings were killing us. We were talking about where we all might be able to go and get a little bit of relaxation and then the message came the message that Herod wanted to talk to us Herod needed to see us and in our way of doing things we understood that the nation the nation must be preserved Jerusalem must continue and Herod, Herod always welcomed our help in the past. The blessings of the priest is, is, a, is a thing that helps him out to be the leader that he is. He's a cunning man. He could shut the temple down like that if he wanted to. People would be rebellious to that, but not against Rome, not against the power that's there. It seems too terrible to contemplate, people would be slaughtered. This way, we give in a little, we modify, 
We become flexible. We adjust to keep the peace. But it's hard to know when to draw that line, is it not? And when to walk on that line because we have to walk it by ourselves. You know, you know, don't you? You know when to conform. You know when to compromise. You know when to resist and how much. When, how, and why Herod, Herod summoned, Herod had called, and we must be about the business of the court, the business of, of running the nation. The palace was in turmoil about something. You could just feel it as you walked in. The, the, the guards were even full of anxiety, and, and the guards were tense, and, and there was a tightness in the air. The sun... The sunset was fiery that evening as it went down and the light bounced off the walls and in the inner courtyard there was, uh, uh, it, was it was like blood red, uh, chest high up on the walls, running down darker and deep into the shadows where we were walking. I tried to stay close to the wall. I tried to stay unnoticed. I was seized with a sudden cramp in my gut. Perhaps... I just needed to go away and not be in this place. It was too late to turn back now the group of us had already entered the gate. Or, or was it? Perhaps my foreboding was for nothing. Perhaps my anxiety was not, was not there, was not worthwhile. In the outer chambers were three richly dressed men. We saw them standing in a, in a group by themselves. They, they were obviously foreigners. They were just sitting there nodding to us and smiling as we passed into Herod's inner chambers. The calm of those three men was eerie and added to my anxiety. When the door crossed behind us, the air inside was heavy. It was rank. Fear makes the body stink. And Herod's breath was foul when he wheezed his question. His voice was tight as a tent rope in the storm. Where is this Christ to be born? Where is this Christ to be born? The question was totally unexpected. I did not expect it at all. I did not anticipate a question like that. Who is Herod to talk of Christ? But he wanted to know. No, I thought to ask, had the Messiah the one we had waited for, had he come? Emmanuel, God with us, had he come? What did those three richly dressed men have to do with this question? What would Herod do if the Messiah had been born? What had those three strangers said to this cruel ruler, Herod? I thought to ask all of those questions. I did, I did. But you know me, I'm going to compromise if I can and, and stay in the shadows and not stick my neck out. Herod was obviously in no mood to be crossed on this night. So I didn't, I didn't cross him. To challenge power is dangerous. The, the touches, the, the touches of his power were as obvious as the torches that were burning so still in their brackets on the wall. The knuckles of the guards were white around their spears. It was quiet as only fear can make a place quiet. You could hear a pin drop. The air was so close you could hardly breathe. Another cramp hit me in the gut like a wave on rocks. Cold sweat broke on my forehead and ran down my back. Every one of us priests knew what Scripture said about the Messiah's birth. We all knew, and we had taught it to each other and to the people in the temple. And we heard from our God, the Lord God is one. Every one of us knew. So the answer Herod wanted was already in our heads and in my mouth, it was a 
awful moment to know that I was about to speak. And I was about to say to this cruel ruler these words in Bethlehem of Judea. In Bethlehem of Judea, I shouted, for it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will govern my people Israel. Whose voice? Whose voice was that? Was that my voice? Did I, did I say that out loud to this, to this cruel king? Had I blurted out those words or had I simply thought them? In any case, the words echoed, a ruler, a ruler, a ruler. Herod was a clever man and now he was angry. What else should be said to soften those words that echoed through the inner chambers? Uh, power is, is jealous, you know. I said nothing. We were, all of us, I, I was. I was just trying to keep my balance. And I knew I had made a grave error. That's hard to do, isn't it? Keep your balance. I mean, Herod order all, ordered all the male babies in Bethlehem to be killed. Power is jealous that way, you know. You have to walk tight lines when you're dealing with powerful people. My responsibilities often keep me awake at night. And the memories and the cramps, always the cramps, pressure, always pressure. Privilege on one hand, and I forget what on the other. I forget what on the other. You know what the prophet Micah really wrote was this. Micah said, O Bethlehem, who are little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be a ruler. And we sang that song tonight together. We sang, O oh, little town of Bethlehem. And I wonder why so long after it's put the other way to hear it in the story, by no means least is Bethlehem. For from Bethlehem will come a ruler, little to be among the clans of, of Israel. There is a difference. One way suggests Bethlehem is much less than the other. But Bethlehem is not less than None of you are less than. We might be little. My wife has a poster, a painting that was done by a friend of ours, and it says, Dear Lord, have mercy on me. The sea is so large, and my boat is so small. It's okay to be little. And I'm going to invite you to the challenge to find the littleness, the disappearing littleness of you, the part that doesn't have to compromise, that you can offer up to God. Uh, so, there's a mystery that we can't understand. We cannot understand why Herod did what Herod did. I, but, but then the question for me is, why did God do what God did? Why, why for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life? Why is that? Why is that something that I have conviction for? It's a part of my faith that helps me grow and, and helps me step into tomorrow. And, and tomorrow is not promised the way that we think it always is. So I gave this sermon uh, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away called Empire. Uh, I was uh, up there in Leelanau County. And I preached about uh, the light of the world. And there was a little girl there She's not a little girl, she's a very talented young woman now. But her name was Emma. And Emma was eight years old going on 40. She was as smart as a 12 year old. I, I, I felt intimidated in her presence sometimes. Emma's mom was a uh, second grade teacher at Glen Lake uh, Public Schools. And I preached this 
message that I was, I'm still going to taking seminary classes and, and trying to figure out uh, if I'm going to be able, good enough to do this, if I'm ever going to be worthy enough to stand up in front of people and talk about Jesus. And, and I was writing this sermon and, and I rewrote it and I wrote it and wrote it and rewrote it and it was about the light of the world. Well, on Tuesday, I went to my mailbox after the Sunday I preached it, and there was a letter. And Emma's mom had said, if you have a question, write it out in the form of a letter. And it said, Dear Pastor Bill, in cursive. I was, I was impressed. Dear Pastor Bill, you talked about the light of the star that shone over top of Bethlehem. Does that light still exist? Please tell me. Emma. So now I've, I've got a task. I have a, a job to do. I have to answer this eight-year-old kid. Uh, does that light still exist? What say you? Does that light still exist? Is the light of that star still bouncing around the universe somewhere? And uh, is anybody here an astrophysicist? If, if you raise your hand, you're going to have to come up and, and stand with me and help me out. But uh, in layman's terms only, uh, yes, that light still exists. The light of Christ is still bouncing around the universe. Light never goes away. It goes somewhere. I don't know where. There are things that I can't see. There are things that I can't know. And it's all right, because we are here, and God wants us to be here, and God wants us to know peace and love and joy and faithfulness. So I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to give yourselves a round of applause. I want you to know, I want you to know that just, just by the fact that you got out of your driveway, and you, I, most of you drove. Did anybody walk or ride a bike? I don't know. But you're here. And you're not here because some person invited you. Herod summoned the priest from the temple in Jerusalem. And he wanted to know, what, what is this? There's, there's a ruler. There's no new ruler. But you aren't here because some king called you, or some pastor, or some priest, or some rabbi sent you a letter. You're here because you want to be here. And God wants you to be here. And he wants us to be together. He wants us to, to become disciples in maturity, in faithfulness. And I am so glad you decided to come this evening to this place because I hate talking to empty rooms. So Merry Christmas.